Well, good morning, church. Welcome to another daily Bible reading. Let me go ahead and open us up in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your provisions. Thank you for this time that you have granted to us by um, your sovereignty and to, to allow us to go to your word and to be able to read and to understand. And Father, we pray that you would help us to understand your will and purpose and that you be glorified in the result. And we pray these things in the name of your Son and our Savior, Christ Jesus. Amen. Well, let's take a look at our passage for this morning, and we've uh, got, we're going back to Second Kings. Uh, previously, we had been in Second Chronicles, and we saw a rather detailed account of a king by the name of Uzziah, who's also named Azariah. In fact, you'll see in Second Kings, he gets referred to by both names. But as we go back to Second Kings 15, what we're going to find is a much less detailed account here. I had said before that Second Chronicles, uh, or the book of Chronicles, often goes into greater detail about the kings of Judah than does um, the books of, of the kings. <clears throat> and so we see in the first verse, we are introduced to Azariah, who's known as Uzziah in Second Chronicles. In verse 2, he was 16 years old when he became king, and he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. So he reigned quite a long time, and this obviously would provide a great deal of stability to Judah in that uh, southern kingdom. Um, what we will find out very soon is that while there was stability in that southern kingdom, um, there was quite a bit of turnover in the northern kingdom of Israel. Um, and we are not given a whole lot of details here as to what happened to Azariah, but we are told in verse 5, the Lord struck the king so that he was a leper to the day of his death. He lived in a separate house while his son Jotham was over the household judging the people of Israel. And I have here written that the greater details are found in Second Chronicles 26, as we saw yesterday. And uh, then the we get to really the end, the rest of the acts of Azariah. Are they not written in the book of Chronicles and the kings of Judah? Azariah slept with his fathers. They buried him with his fathers in the city of David. And then Jotham, his son, becomes king in his place. But before we talk about Jotham, we've got to go back and shift our focus back to Israel and all the turnover that happened with the kings of Israel. So in verse 8, we are introduced to Zechariah. In the 38th year of Azariah, king of Judah, Zechariah, the son of Jeroboam, became king over Israel. But he was only king for about six months. And we see that he was evil in verse 9. And then verse 10, we see that Shalom, the son of Jabesh, conspired against him, struck him before the people, killed him, and reigned in his place. And verse 12 reveals, reveals that this is the word of the Lord, which he spoke to Jehu, saying, Your sons to the fourth generation shall, shall sit on the throne of Israel. Now, Jehu, if you remember, he was the man who ended up um, assassinating kings in both the northern and southern kingdom. And he did it by the will of the Lord. And so the Lord um, commended him for it and gave him this word that your sons to the fourth generation shall reign. Zechariah was that fourth generation. And obviously that was um, a reward of sorts to Jehu, but also um, we can see it as judgment of sorts because that household did not remain faithful and it was only to four generations. And so Shalom, the one who had assassinated Zechariah, he takes over in verse 13. Shalom, son of Jabesh, became king in the 39th year of Uzziah, and he reigned only one month. And so after one month, verse 14, we see that Menahem, son of Gadi, went up to Tirzah, came to Samaria, struck Shalom, son of Jabesh, in Samaria, killed him, and became king in his place. And so then now we go to Menahem, and verse 16, then Menahem struck Tipsha and all who were in it and its borders from Tirzah because they did not open it up to him. Therefore, he struck it and ripped up all its women who were with child. In the 39th year of Azariah, king of Judah, Menahem, son of Gadi, became king over Israel, and he reigned 10 years. So he has a little bit of a longer reign. And, of, and he, of course, does evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart all his days from the sins of Jeroboam. And then in verse 19, we see that Pul, king of Assyria, came to the land. And Menahem, the king of Israel, gave Pul a thousand talents of silver so that his hand might be with him to strengthen the kingdom under his rule. And so as has been characteristic of many of the rebellious kings, they did not go to the Lord for help and support and strengthening, but rather they went to um, human instruments, um, human instruments or false gods in some cases. So he goes to Assyria. He pays off Assyria. And verse 20 says, Menahem exacted the money from Israel, even from all the mighty men of wealth, from each 
man 50 shekels of silver to pay the king of Assyria. So the king of Assyria returned, did not remain there in the land. Now, the rest of the acts of Menahem and all that he did, they are documented elsewhere. Menahem slept with his fathers, and then Pekah, Pekahiah, his son, becomes king in his place. And so in verse 23, we see that in the 50th year of Azariah, king of Judah, Pekahiah, son of Menahem, became king over Israel and Samara, and he reigned only two years. He did evil, um, just as just like the, um, the first king of Israel, Jeroboam. And Pekah, the son of Ramalia, his officer, conspired against him and struck him in Samaria. So Pekahiah was assassinated by Pekah. Despite the names, they're not related. We have another change of families going on here. And so then we get to, well, let's read the rest of verse 25. Pekah, Pekah son of Ramalia, Remaliah, his officer, conspired against him, struck him in Samaria in the castle of the king's house, with Argob and Aria, and with him were 50 men of the Gileadites. And he killed him and became king in his place. And so in verse 27, in the 52nd year of Azariah, king of Judah, Pekah, the son of Ramalia, became king over Israel and Samaria, and he reigned 20 years. So now we have a little bit more of a stable reign, but despite that length, he also did evil in the sight of the Lord. And once again, being compared to Jeroboam, the son of Nabat. And verse 29, in the days of Pekah, king of Israel, Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, came and captured Ejon and Abel, Beth, Maacah, and Genoa, and Kadesh, and Hazor, and Gilead, and Galilee, all the land of Naphtali. So we have Assyria now capturing lands um, in Israel. And he carried them captive to Assyria. And Hosea, the son of Ella, made a conspiracy conspiracy against Pekah, the son of Ramalia, and struck him and put him to death be and became king in his place in the 20th year of Jotham, the son of Uzziah. So what we have here, and by the way, Jotham, the son of Uzziah, that's, so we see here in the book of Kings, he is referred to as both Uzziah and Azariah. You know, it's just the way, um, way it goes. And we see the reference to Azariah in verse 27, Uzziah in verse 30, um, it's not so different um, than what we do today in certain cases where we might call someone named Robert, Bob, um, or even one of our own deacons, we'll call him Richard or Dick. So um, th this is just a case of a person being referred to by different names. It's not uh, proof, as some say, that um, there are um, different authors here or that, that these words are not inspired by God. So what we see here, though, I wanted to point out in verse 25 is the presence of Assyria. Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, he came, he captured a bunch of places, he carried them captive to Assyria. And so we see the captivity to Assyria already starting in the, king of, in, in the land of Israel, that northern kingdom. And in fact, uh, Hosea, uh, who assassinated uh, Pekah, would end up being the last king in Israel before that um, exile is made complete. And so verse 31, we come to the end of Pekah's reign. And by the time we get to verse 32, now we are talking about Jotham. Jotham becomes king of Judah in the second year of Pekah, the son of Ramalia. Um, Jotham takes over that reign. Verse 33, he was 25 years old when he became king. He reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord. He did according to all that his father Uzziah had done. Only the high places were not taken away. The people still sacrificed, burned incense. He built the upper gate of the house and of the Lord. And then we come to the end of the acts of Jotham. But in verse 37, we see in those days, the Lord began to send Rezin, king of Aram and Pekah, the son of Ramalia, against Judah. So as we had just read about Pekah and his assassination at the hands of Hosea, we are going back and seeing that Pekah in his life, he was actually starting to work together with Aram um, against Judah. And then so now we go to 2 Kings chapter 16, and we see that in the 17th year, Pekah, the son of Ramalia, Ahaz, the son of Jotham, king of Judah, became king. So the son of uh, Jotham would be Ahaz. Ahaz was 20 years old when he became king. He reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. But unlike his father and his father's father, he did not do what is right in the sight of the Lord, his God, as his father David had done. But he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel, even made his sons pass through fire. Um, and this would have been uh, the, 
the, the ways of false worship from some of the foreign nations, according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had driven out before the sons of Israel. He sacrificed and burned incense on the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. This is in contrast to offering sacrifices in the temple of God. But not only that, um, Ahaz uses the treasury, um, uses the metals that are in the temple to pay off Assyria. So verse 5, then Rezin, king of Aram, and Pekah, son of Ramalia. And remember, we had just read that those two were coming against, Israel, against Judah, I should say. They came to Jerusalem to wage war. They besieged Ahaz and could not overcome him. At that time, Rezin, king of Aram, recovered Eloth for Aram, cleared the Judeans out of Eloth entirely, and the Arameans came to Eloth and have lived there to this day. <clears throat> So Ahaz sent messengers to Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, saying, I am your servant and your son. Come up and deliver me from the hand of the king of Aram and from the hand of the king of Israel, who are rising up against me. And once again, and this time this is a son of David. This is someone in the Davidic household um, who should have known from the examples of his predecessors that those who go to the Lord are blessed by the Lord. Those who rely on foreign nations are cursed. Um, but nevertheless, he goes to Assyria because Assyria is the is the major power that's um, emerging at this time. And so verse 8, Ahaz took the silver and the gold that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasuries of the king's house and sent a present to the king of Assyria. So the king of Assyria listened to him and the king of Assyria went up against Damascus, captured it, carried the people of it away into exile to Kir and then put resin to death. <clears throat> And then not only that, but Ahaz goes further. He commits adultery. So verse 10, Now King Ahaz went to Damascus to meet Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, and saw the altar that was in Damascus. And King Ahaz sent to Arija the priest, the pattern of the altar and its model according to all its workmanship. So this is King Ahaz going to Damascus, which is in Aram. He sees the altar that's there, and he wants to model it. He wants to copy it. And verse 11, it just as bad, if not worse, is that the priest cooperates. The priest, who should have been encouraging worship to Yahweh, encouraging worship in the temple, he ends up building this altar um, from the plans that were given to him. According to all that King Ahaz had sent from Damascus, thus Urijah the priest made it before the coming of King Ahaz from Damascus. And when the king came from Damascus, the king saw the altar, so he comes back from Damascus into Judah. He sees the altar. The king approached the altar and went up to it, and he burnt his burnt offering and his meal offering, poured his drink offering, and sprinkled the blood of his peace offering on the altar. These are all the kinds of offerings that were commended in the book of Leviticus to Israel, but they were to be done to the true God in the temple. And here he is, he's doing it on an altar built for a false god. The bronze altar, which was before the Lord, he brought from the front of the house from between his altar and the house of the Lord, and he put it on the north side of his altar. Then King Ahaz commanded Urijah. So he's not only committing false worship, he is leading the priest to do the same. Upon the great altar burned the morning burnt offering and the evening meal offering, the king's burnt offering and his meal offering, with the burnt offering of all the people of the land and their meal offering and their drink offerings and sprinkle it on the blood of the burnt offering uh, and all the blood of the sacrifice, but the blood, but the bronze altar shall be for me to inquire by. So Urijah the priest did according to all that King Ahaz commanded. Then King Ahaz cut off the borders of the stands and removed the laver from them. He also took down the sea from the bronze oxen, which were under it and put it on the pavement of stone. The covered way for the Sabbath, which they had built in the house and the outer entry of the king, he removed from the house of the Lord because of the king of Assyria. So what we have here is King Ahaz not only committing adultery, not only having this altar being built, not only leading the priest to worship to this, but also leading all of Judah to worship to this uh, false god. And then Ahaz dies, and then in verse 20, he slept with his fathers, who was buried with his fathers in the city of David, and his son Hezekiah reigned in his place. And as we will find out um, in the next reading, Hezekiah is a good king that ends up reversing a lot that was done here. 
Well, as we see here, we covered a couple of chapters from 2 Kings, and I think I had mentioned that most of this was about Israel, but we see that um, that last chapter that we covered was mostly about King Ahaz and uh, what he did uh, in Judah, really the evil that he had committed. And now we turn our attention to Matthew chapter 21. And we remember that there had been a lot of confrontations between Jesus Christ and the Jewish leaders. But now Matthew 21, after Jesus had warned his disciples three times that he must go to Jerusalem and be persecuted and die and be raised up on the third day, they finally arrived back to Jerusalem. Um, they had started making their trek to Jerusalem starting in uh, Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 16 is when um, the disciples confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and then after that, they head back towards Jerusalem. So verse 1, we have what's often called the triumphal entry, but I wouldn't necessarily call it that, though it is a prophesied event. They approached Jerusalem, came to Bethpage. <clears throat> Jesus sent two disciples. Verse 2, saying, go, go into the village opposite you. Immediately you will find a donkey tied to a colt. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say the Lord has needed them. So they did exactly that, and this was to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. Now, I said that this is often referred to as the triumphal entry. Why do I say this is not really the triumphal entry? Because I believe that the real triumphal entry will happen in Revelation 19 when Jesus rides in on the white horse and he brings judgment. <clears throat> in this case, um, he is uh, coming to really be sent to the cross. And it's a triumph for us in the sense that we were given salvation as a result of that work, but it's not the true triumph of our king. Verse 6, the disciples went and ju did just as Jesus had instructed them. And so as they were coming in, um, verse 9, we see the crowds were going ahead of him and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. So whether they realize it or not, they are actually singing praises. And even from their words, they're praising the one who is the Messiah. Now, I say whether they realize it or not, because while they are reciting these words, by the end of this week, we know that they're going to be screaming, crucify, crucify him. And they're going to be choosing Barabbas over him. So while they may proclaim it, um, as one professor made the case to me that they were saying what what was more than what they truly understood. And verse 10, when he had entered Jerusalem, all the city stirred, saying, Who is this? And the crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from, the Naz from Nazareth in Galilee. <clears throat> so we see there in verse 11 that they really just refer to him as a prophet, not realizing that by calling him son of David, he really is not just a prophet, but he is the Messiah. And so verse 12, um, Jesus then cleanses the temple. Um, and I believe he did this twice, and this would be the second time he did it. Verse 13, he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a robber's den. And if you were to look up that reference to house of prayer, and I believe that goes back to Isaiah, you would find that this is a house of prayer for all the nations. And of course, when you think about Solomon and his prayer of dedication, when he first opened up the temple, he made it very clear that this was indeed a house of prayer, not just for the Israelites, but even for those who come seeking the true God of Israel um, from among foreign nations. And then verse 14, the blind and the lame came to him in the temple. He healed them. When the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he had done and the children who were shouting in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they became indignant. And this is why there was such strong judgment pronounced upon them because they were the ones that should have recognized um, that Jesus was indeed fulfilling the prophecies of the Old Testament, but rather they became indignant when people even started to refer to him as the son of David. Verse 16, they said to him, do you hear what these children are saying? And Jesus said to him, yes, have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babes you have prepared praise for yourself? And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany and spent the night there. So these Jewish leaders <clears throat> understood exactly what was being proclaimed when Jesus was being referred to as son of David. And then we get to verse 18, and we have kind of this real-life parable of the nation of Israel. Verse 18, now in the morning when he returned to the city, he became hungry, and seeing a lone fig tree by the road, he came to it, 
found nothing on it except leaves only. And he said to it, No longer shall there be any fruit from you. And at once the fig tree withered. Seeing this, the disciples were amazed and asked, How did the fig tree wither all at once? And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what is done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, Be taken up and cast into the sea, it will happen. And all things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. This is not a health, wealth, and prosperity gospel, but this is Jesus saying that if you do the will of God, you will do amazing things according to the will of God if you have faith in him. But this lone fig tree, the fact that there was no fruit found on it, and he cursed that tree and it withered all at once. Um, we are in, right now, Matthew chapter 21. In chapter 22, there's going to be a final confrontation between Jesus Christ and the religious leaders. And in chapter 23, you're going to see um, a just incredible sequence of, um, of woes from Jesus Christ to those uh, religious leaders. And we'll get there in a, couple of, um, in a couple of Bible readings. And then when we get to verse 23, he enters the temple again and his authority is challenged. The chief priests and the elders of the people came to him while he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things and who gave you this authority? Now, what's interesting is at the end of the book of Matthew, what does Jesus say? He says, all authority has been given to me in earth um, and uh, in heaven. But here, verse 24, Jesus said to them, I will ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Verse 25, the baptism of John was from what source, from heaven or from men? And they began reasoning among themselves, saying, if we say from heaven, he will say to us, why, then why did you not believe him? But if we say from men, we fear the people, for they all regard John as a prophet. And answering Jesus, they said, we do not know. He also said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. So you see that they were asked a question and they didn't want to answer the question because in one sense, if they answered one way, they would be judged by the people. If they answered another way, then they're admitting that they did not believe a prophet that was sent by God. And then verse 28, we see judgment being brought from Jesus to these leaders. Once again, this is going to be expanded even further in chapter 23. But he says, what do you think? A man has two sons. He came to the first and said, son, go to work today in the vineyard. And he answered, I will not. And afterward, he regretted it and went. The man came to the second son and said the same thing. And he, this second son said, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of the Father? They said, the first. And Jesus said to them, truly, I say to you, that the tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and prostitutes did believe him. And you, seeing this, did not even feel remorse afterwards so as to believe him. So while they were refusing to answer that prior question as to um, who sent uh, John, uh, what, what was his baptism from? Um, he goes on to condemn them for not believing John the Baptist. And in essence, this parable that this little parable that Jesus tells, this little story that Jesus tells is to illustrate the fact that the Israelites claim to be obedient, but they are not obedient. And then those who are sinners, the tax collectors, the prostitutes, those who are deemed sinners by the religious elite, they ended up following, they're going to enter the kingdom of heaven. And then we have this uh, blistering parable of the vineyard owner. Yesterday we had a different kind of uh, vineyard parable. This one is absolutely blistering and it is more judgment against these religious leaders. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who built a vineyard, put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, built a tower and rented it out to vine growers and went on a journey. When the harvest time approached, he sent his slaves to the vine growers to receive his produce. The vine growers took his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. And again, he sent another group of slaves, larger than the first, and they did the same thing to them. And afterwards, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the vine growers saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. They took him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine growers? 
And they said to him, and this is the crowd of Jews that are around him, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end and it will and will rent out the vineyard to other vine growers who will pay him the proceeds at the proper seasons. Now, this was a very easy parable to understand because vine growing was a very common activity at this time. So the answer, at least in a earthly and human sense, was very obvious. Verse 42, now Jesus brings in the spiritual significance. Jesus said to them, did you never read in the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord, and it is a marvelous in our eyes. See, Jesus is referring to himself as the chief cornerstone that the builders rejected. That would be the Jews. And verse 43, Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing the fruit of it. And he who falls on this stone will be broken into pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they understood that he was speaking about them. And when they sought to seize them, they feared, when they sought to seize him, they feared the people because they considered him to be a prophet. <clears throat> So that brings us to the end of Matthew chapter 21, and we're seeing more and more judgment being heaped up upon the religious elite as they continue to refuse to repent despite all the evidence given to him. Well, that brings us to the end of our reading for this morning. Hopefully this has been helpful. And to all this, when we think about the Old Testament, what it has shown us, the failure of these kings and the worship of false gods, we see it in many ways paralleled by the accounts of Jesus Christ and how he was rejected, rejected really by his own people, even though they thought they had advanced far beyond their forefathers. When we get a couple of chapters further, we will see that Jesus Christ will essentially tell them that you are no different than your fathers who killed all the prophets because they will eventually kill Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God that Jesus died on the cross and that by his work, our sins were not only forgiven, but we were given the gift of the Holy Spirit. We were given a new heart, and we now have the power and the ability to do God's will, to follow after God in a way that we could not before. So let me go ahead and close this out in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this morning and for these words. Father, may we not forget just the wickedness that is in all of mankind, that was in even our hearts before you came and saved us. Father, we're so thankful for his sacrifice on the cross and the salvation that it brought to us. Father, I pray that you would continue to protect the church physically and spiritually. And Father, help us to be prepared even now as we look forward to our time of worship tomorrow. And we give thanks to you and pray these things in the name of your Son, Christ Jesus. Amen. Well, thank you once again for joining us uh, this morning um, as we have come to another end of the week of our daily Bible readings. I look forward to seeing you again tomorrow morning when we gather for corporate worship. Have a wonderful rest of the day and God bless.